I want to read Romans chapter 1. We're going to read verse 16 and 17, and we're just going to camp out there a little bit this morning. It says this. It says, For I am not ashamed. Come on, look at your neighbor and say, I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God to salvation for everyone who believes, for the Jew first and also for the Greek. For in it the righteousness of God is revealed from faith to faith, as it is written, the just shall live by faith. Man, what a powerful truth. I, I've, been, I've been really reading my Bible a lot lately. I mean, come on. I mean, how many of y'all know it's a good idea for me to read my Bible a lot? It's a good idea for you to read your Bible. It, it edifies me. I love what, what Charles Stanley said a long time ago. He said, the Bible is the only book that whenever you read it, it reads you. You know, and it's like, man, the Bible transforms, it changes. The book of Romans is powerful, man. How many of you realize that Paul had some, some very special revelation of who Jesus is? I mean, like Romans chapter 12 says, do not be conformed to the pattern of this world, you know, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. I mean, if you look in Romans chapter 3, you, you see that for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God, you know. Romans chapter 6, he says, it says, and the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is everlasting life. You know, Romans 5, it says that for God, it says that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Romans chapter 10, 23 says, for, it says this, it says, for whosoever calls upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. I mean, these are the words of Paul, this great apostle, and he leads off with this idea. He says, I am not ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ, for it is what? The power of God unto salvation. And, and that's, man, I've just been thinking about that over this week, and I've been thinking about Paul's life. I mean, we've been studying in the book of Acts um, uh, for on Wednesday nights during our midweek, and it's just like, man, I'm reading about Paul's missionary journeys, you know? And I'm like, man, what a... What a man of God. You know, he was amazing. He did some amazing things. What an assignment of God. But we have to realize that, that Paul made a decision in his faith. Not only that was, was he going to preach, but he was going to preach the gospel because he understood the gospel was the power of God unto salvation. Man, I, I was, uh, you know, as, as a pastor and, and as a minister and as a church leader, you know, you have, to, you have this understanding. We have to evaluate our success, right? I mean, how many of y'all are in business, right? You have these key point indicators. You set goals. You set things. You have to evaluate your success. And, and many times in church world, we evaluate our success by, by a lot of things, by attendance, by, by baptisms, by, by spirit, being, people being spirit, filled with the Spirit, by Sunday school attendance, by all. I mean, you have to do that, right? Paul, and people boast about those things. Man, we had 6,000 in attendance at this thing, or we had 25 people saved, or we had 30 people baptized. And man, you almost get a sense of pride in that, right? Paul was this man. He says, I am not ashamed of the gospel. And then I love this, man. In 1 Corinthians, Paul really clarifies it. He says, whatever anyone else dares to boast about, He's like, so Paul, this, this great missionary, I mean, literally wrote two-thirds of the New Testament. He says, whatever anyone else dares to boast about, he says, I'm speaking as a fool. I also dare to boast about. He says, are they Hebrews? So am I. Are they Israelites? So am I. Are they Abraham's descendants? So am I. Are they servants of Christ? I am out of my mind to talk like this, but I am more for I have worked much harder. And then Paul, I mean, most of us, I mean, I've been a pastor. I planted seven churches. I did all this other stuff. Paul doesn't mention any of that. This is what Paul boasts about. Paul doesn't boast about how many converts, how many people were baptized. He doesn't, he doesn't boast about any of those things. Paul says this. He says this. He says, I have worked much harder. I mean, ministry is hard work. Christianity is hard work. If you got saved so you don't have to work. So Somebody talk about Christianity is a crutch. They've, that person wasn't saved. They've been in prison. So Paul's worked harder. He's been in prison more frequently, been flogged more severely, and been exposed to death again and again. Five times I was received from the Jews 
I had received from the Jews the forty lashes minus one. Three times I was beaten with rods. Once I was pelted with stones. Three times I was shipwrecked. I spent the, a, a night and a day in an open sea. I have been constantly on the move. I have been in danger of rivers, in danger from bandits, in danger from fellow Jews, in danger from Gentiles, in danger in the city, in danger in the country, in danger at sea, in danger from false believers. I have labored and toiled and have often gone without sleep. I have known hunger and thirst and have often gone without food. I have been cold and naked. And besides everything else, I face daily the pressure of my concern for all the churches. This man, that Paul is writing to a group of people he's trying to reach with the gospel of Jesus. And this is what he decides to boast about. He says, besides all this shipwreck, this and that, the concern, I mean, all this, I said, besides that, I got people that complain about stuff at church. I got to be... I got to pray for y'all. Y'all always give me a hard time, you know? It's not me. That was Paul's experience. I love y'all, Paul. Paul, this is, I mean, this is the Paul that wrote this. I am, because I am not ashamed of the gospel. Man, I, I love this. I'm, I'm going to quote D.L. Moody, who, who is a great Bible teacher. They have actually the Moody Bible Institute. And he was the founder of that. He commented this about the gospel. He said, the gospel is like a lion. And, and I love that we sang that song. You know, uh, our God is the lion. He's the lion of Judah. Go on, we prayed today that we, we need to have that lion's roar. We need to let out the Jesus within us. If our God is a lion, can we let the lion out? D.L. Moody. The gospel is like a lion. All the preacher has to do is to open the door of the cage and get out of the way. The gospel is the power of God for salvation for everyone who believes. I, I just want to camp out here a little bit this morning and unpack this idea. Paul, the apostle, says, I'm unashamed of the gospel. Man, I remember when I first gave my heart to Jesus, and I thought that everybody would be happy that I was now a Jesus freak. You know, I thought that everybody would be happy that I quit drinking and smoking and cussing and spitting and doing all this other stuff, and I started going to church. You know, they were like, they weren't happy. I couldn't figure this out. My friends left me. They abandoned me. I was shipwrecked for like 10 minutes. Not like Paul. I was never beaten, flogged, and any of that stuff. Man, we live in, we're in a blessed country where we can share the gospel of Jesus Christ. Friends, let's not quit fighting for our freedoms of religion, our freedoms of expression, our freedoms of speech. Man, we have to fight for those things. I was reminded, just kind of a side story a little bit, because I didn't get to get to it in the first service. I'll tell it first in second service. I, I was reminded yesterday, I was, we watched a, me and Shannon said, I watched a documentary about Richard Wormbrand. Anybody ever heard of him? He was the founder of Voice of Mortars International. Richard Wormbrand, he was a preacher, a Lutheran preacher in, in Romania, whenever the communist agenda of the Russians came into Romania. And, they, and what they did, they were smart in, Rom in Romania. They said, well, they thought they were being smart. They got all the pastors and the preachers and the priests and, the, and the, all those other people, and they gathered them up, and they were like, would you please support our agenda? We're not here to hurt people. We're here to help people. We're here to promote you know, the, the, the communist way, everybody for everybody. And all the preachers were going along with it, man. They were, you know, they're not here. They're going to do good things. These are good people. And Richard Wormbrand, of course, having seen what took place in Russia, the persecution that took place, stands up in the midst of all of these men and says, we don't serve these men. We don't serve governments. We don't serve politics, but we serve the Lord, the creator of the heavens and the earth. And let me tell you, he paid a dear price for that. He, he wrote a great book. I encourage you to get it. It's called The Voice of Mortars. And they actually have a magazine. You can go on their website, voiceofmortars.com or something like that. If you Google Voice of Mortars, you'll be in good shape and support their, uh, you can get their magazine and all that stuff. I mean, how many of you know people suffer for the gospel? But the gospel is worth suffering for. Why? Because it is the power of God unto salvation. I am not ashamed of the gospel. It's important that we realize that the gospel is not an argument. It's not a way of life. It's not a philosophy. It's not a religion, right? Nobody says, what religion are you? I'm the gospel religion. 
Nobody says that. The gospel is not any of those things. The gospel is the fulfillment of an ancient promise that God made in the garden. The, go- the gospel is a fulfillment of, it's a reality of God working actively in our lives. I, I, I don't believe the gospel only because I read it in the Word. I believe it because I read it in the Word, but I believe it because I live it in my life. I've seen God deliver me. I've seen God deliver people. I've seen God change me, transform me. It's not just an idea or an argument. It's not a philosophy. The gospel is Jesus Christ raised from the dead on the third day, went into the heaven, and he sent the Holy Spirit to the earth on the day of Pentecost that he might live and dwell within me. The gospel is within me. I don't believe the gospel. I am the gospel. Come on, look at your neighbor and say, I am the gospel. It's not a philosophy. It's a fulfillment of God's ancient promises that he would be our provider, our healer, our savior, our deliverer, that he's mighty. The gospel gives life to humanity through the shed blood of of Jesus Christ. The gospel is the power of God unto salvation. This is the key idea. The gospel is the power. It's powerful. It's the power. I wish I could figure out a different way to say it, but I'm going to say it the same way I said it three times. It's the, the gospel is the power of God unto salvation. Man, this past week, we saw what happens when the power goes out. Come on, I mean, man, and unprecedented record temperatures in Texas and the snow and the sleet and the rain, and even in Louisiana. Come on, how many of you had busted pipes? How many of you had power that went out? How many of you had, I mean, starved? No, not nobody, nobody starved. We're in South Louisiana, man. Everybody got a freezer, right? And in the cold weather, you just put everything outside. It's good. But, but it's amazing what happens when the power goes out. See, across Texas and Louisiana, we had record cold temperatures, and many lost power for days. And because the effects of that lost power, things bad begin to happen. Pipes begin to bust. Go on, heaters quit working. People begin to be isolated and secluded. I believe that many times, I mean, me, I'll, I'll be the first one to admit, I mean, I've been through some hurricanes, so I get it. But like, man, when, and when it's a hurricane, it's just hot, right? It's hot, it's nasty, it's gross. But man, you could freeze to death. I mean, you might be able to sweat to death in Louisiana, but, but freezing to death, that's a whole, I've taken the power for granted. I mean, the, my, my ability to just go turn the heat on, uh, to turn a light on, to flush a toilet, I was talking to my dad. He's, a, he, he's one of the presidents of like the Houston Area Municipal Utilities District. The, he's the president of the MUD. I'm like, Dad, you got to figure out a better name. But, but we're talking about, like in Houston, they were having water outs and going out. I was like, well, Dad, why is the water going out? Don't you have wells? Yeah, but, but the pumps that pump the well are frozen. And, and the heater, we don't have power to run the heaters. I'm like, man, y'all got to think about this stuff. Like, well, it doesn't typically freeze in Houston. But when the power goes out, it's, it's incredible. How many of you know when we lose sight of the power in the church, things begin to fall apart? Uh, we, we need to be reminded here today, and I'm here to remind you today, that the power of the church isn't in our worship music. It's not in our songs. It's not even in our Bible reading, in our prayer time. It, it's not in our worship. It's not in our praise. It's not in our relationships or our small groups. The power of the church is the power of the gospel. The gospel is the power of God unto salvation. The reality that Jesus Christ came to this earth, died for me. And you, even while we were yet sinners, Christ died. Man, while I was homeless, living on the street, trying to steal money to buy beer. I mean, think about this condition. Christ said, I'm going to die for that guy. We need to be reminded of where our power is. See, I I believe as a church, we can put our, we can trust the alternative energy. Uh, That's a whole nother issue. We're in South Louisiana. Well, drill, baby, drill, okay? I worked in the oil field, and let me tell you, man, that stuff that happened in Texas, I don't know the whole full of it, but I saw the frozen wind turbines. And many times, even in the church, we try to draw energy from 
other places. We try to draw energy from other power sources. But many of us, we can draw energy even in our own lives from things beside. The power comes from where? What is the power of God? The gospel. I want to just say, say this with me. The gospel is the power of God unto salvation. Look, if that's all we walk away with, I've done my job. I just need you to know that the gospel is the power. Money's not the power. Come on, how many of y'all know? Man, cash is king, right? The money, if you, whoever's got the gold, it makes all the rules. That's the golden rule, right? How many of you are money? If I just had more money, if I just had more influence, if I just had more education, if I just had more religion, the truth is, is money is like an alternative energy source in the church. But we preach prosperity more than we preach the gospel. Is money evil? No. But the Bible's clear. It says that you can't love mammon and you can't love the Lord. It says, but because a man can't serve two masters, choose you this day whom you will serve. Money is a false power. It's a, look, everybody, oh, all the people with all the money, the, the Rockefellers and, the, and all the Jewish families got all the money. They got all the power. No, they don't. Jesus Christ has all the power. He's the King of kings, the Lord of lords. The gospel is the power of God unto salvation. Money, when it runs out, people just fall into despair. The gospel never runs out. It's the ultimate renewable energy. It's not even renewable, it's eternal. It's the ultimate eternal energy source. It's more power of the, the nuclear. I mean, it's amazing. This power of God and the salvation, I love it, man. It's powerful. I wish I had another word to say. I'm just going to say it's power, power, power. Well, power, how many of you know influence is, is everybody, hey man, influence is everything. You know, John Maxwell, you know, leadership is influence, nothing more, nothing less. You know, but, but you can't just gain more influence. You can't just gain more leadership. You just can't gain more position and then be, think that that's power. Some people think if I just get high enough, then I can begin to control things. The truth is you can't ever get high enough. It's a false power because power, influence, leadership, all that stuff always costs you something. Eventually, if you're trying to grow the corporate ladder, eventually you're going to have to step on somebody else's hands. You're going to have to step on somebody else's toes to get to where you want to go. It's going to cost you somewhere morally, ethically. You're going to make decisions that you wouldn't normally make because you've called power, influence, and leadership your God. My dad used to say, he says, Joe, be careful whose toes you step on. It might be connected to the rear end you got to kiss later. And I say that, that's proverbally, that's not a literal thing. I know, I say stuff sometimes, second service moan, man, y'all just pull out stuff out of me. I don't, <laughs> I say stuff and Pastor Marshall's going to call me, Joe. <laughs> but but, but pa power, if we're just seeking power, it costs us relationships. I mean, we're, we're willing to lose relationships to gain position. Power is a false sense of influence. Authority is a false power. Education. How many of y'all ever heard the saying, knowledge is power? You ever, am I the only person? Y'all heard that? Raise your hand if you heard it. Yeah. Okay, mo enough. Knowledge is power. I mean, listen to this. 1 Corinthians chapter 8, verse 1 and 2 says this simply. Knowledge puffs up, but love edifies. If anyone thinks he knows anything, he knows nothing. You can chase after knowledge to try to gain power. You can chase after knowledge to try to gain position. But the truth is there's always somebody that knows more and smarter than you. Uh, there's always somebody that knows more than you. And it all, I, know it's, I know it's tough realities, Jen, I know. I don't know anybody smarter than you. I'm just... It's a tough reality. Man, I love my pastor, uh, uh, Brother Kent. He's been went to be with the Lord a few years ago. And he would always say, man, as soon as I think I got it figured out, I realized I don't have it figured out at all. <laughs> like the more I know, the, the more I know, I know, don't know. I don't know how to say that. Because we could put all of our energy effort. It's like, if I just get an education, maybe I'll be more effective in ministry. If I just get an education, maybe I'll get a promotion. If, if I just read this book, if I get this certificate, maybe God can do this then. Let me tell you what the power is not in your education. If you want to tap into the power of God in your life, you know what the power is? It's the gospel. That's the power. Religion. False powers. 
man, like, I, I mean, I, I'm a religious leader, I guess you can say in, in, in most sense of the word, but, but our traditions don't give us power. Our songs, our hymns, our prayers, all those things don't give us power. The pa- because when we've exhausted all of these things, when we've exhausted all the money, when we've exhausted all the influence, when we've exhausted our education, when we've exhausted all of our religious resources, you see what ends up happening is we fall into a place of despair. We fall into a place of longing, a place of wanting. We're all like, like the people and poor people in Texas huddled around a, a terracotta pot with some candles underneath it trying to stay alive. Because we've unplugged from the source of power in the church, which is the gospel of Jesus Christ. Jesus tells this parable in Matthew 7, 24 uh, through 27. He says, therefore, whoever hears these sayings of mine and does them. I just want to pause right there for a second, right? Jesus doesn't just say, whoever hears these sayings of mine. He doesn't just say, whoever does these sayings of mine, we have to hear and do. James says, don't just be hearers of the word, be doers of the word. Come on, the gospel is, a, is an action. It's an action. We have to do the gospel. We have to do the power. Let me tell you, man, it's the power of God unto salvation. I, I don't know if I've said that yet. The gospel is the power. The money is not the power. The influence is not the power. Your education is not the power. You're, 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 man, Tom Brady is, well, he might be. I don't know. I mean, that's just, he won a Super Bowl with the Bucks. That's, that's pretty impressive. But he's still not the power. Jesus says, whoever hears in these sayings of mine and does them, I will take, I will liken him to a wise man who built his house on the rock. And the rain descended and the floods came and the winds blew and beat on the house and it did not fall for it was founded on the rock, the gospel. For everyone who hears these things of mine and does not do them. See, we all hear this just decision is, the difference is, is what we do with it. That's the difference. The difference isn't who hears. We all have heard is what we do with it. It says, whoever hears and doesn't do them will be like a foolish man who built his house on the sand, and the rain descended, and the floods came, and the winds blew and beat on that house, and it fell, and great was its fall. See, I believe in America today that there is a storm coming. Man, J- Jesus said, you can, you can look at the sky and see if it's going to rain tomorrow, but you can't see the signs of the times, the things that are right in front of you, and realize that the, ends are, the end is drawing near. How many of you realize that there is a storm that is brewing in our land today? There is, there is agitation, frustration, anxiety, and stress. Because why? Because we've removed the power source from our nation. We've removed the power source from our schools. We've removed the power source from our businesses. We've removed the power source from government. Why? Because the power is what? The gospel of Jesus Christ. It's the power of God unto salvation. We pull, we pull the plug and wonder why kids are getting lost in our schools. Because we've built a house on sand. We've built a house on money. We've built a house on popularity. We've built a house on politics. We've built a house on education. All of those things, none of those things are bad. I'm just not building a house on them. I'm going to use all those things to build the house. I'm just not building my house on it. The foundation is the gospel. So what is the gospel? Man, the gospel is the good news. It's the good news. It's the glad tidings. It's the proclamation. What's the good news? I I think since we're talking about Paul, this is what Paul preached. I struggled with these things when I was first a Christian. Jesus preached about the kingdom of God, the kingdom of heaven. Man, I was like, what is the kingdom of heaven? You know, I really, it's like the Bible doesn't, I don't know. So if you you want to know, in a few weeks, we're going to start an evangelism class and come to the evangelism class and you will walk away knowing what the kingdom of God is, what the kingdom of heaven is. What is the gospel? What's the good news? What is it? It's simply, Paul says it in Romans chapter 5, verses 6, 6 through 10. He says, for when we were still without strength, in due time, Christ died for the ungodly. Well, the gospel is that Jesus died for us while we were weak, while we were broken. Let me tell you something. If you got it all together, if you got it all together, it, let me just say it this way instead. If you're broken and ashamed and, 
and devastated. And let me say, you are a perfect candidate for the gospel. It says, for when we were without strength, in due time Christ died for the ungodly. For scarcely for a righteous man will one die. Yet perhaps for a good man someone would even dare to die. But God demonstrates his own love towards us that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Much more than having now been justified by his blood, we shall be saved from wrath through him. For if when we were enemies, we were reconciled to God through the death of his son, much more having been reconciled, shall we be saved by his life. You see, the gospel is that Jesus Christ died for you. And he was raised again to new life for you. You see, because whenever we are lost, see, this is the, this is the concept. When, when, whenever we have false powers, right? Man, I, I remember in my life, I was chasing after money. I was chasing after education. I was chasing after things. But there came a point in my life where I had to die to those things. I had to make a decision. Where am I going to plug my plug into? Am I going to plug it into trying to make more money? Or am I going to plug it into the gospel? Am I going to plug it into trying to get more education and influence at work and trying to get a promotion and chase after those things? Or am I going to surrender that life and, and, and surrender it to the, to the will of Jesus Christ? The, the, it's, it's just the truth. I had to die to myself. I, I, I've not, I don't really talk about this publicly. It's just kind of a, a Joe theory. But I believe whenever you give your heart to Jesus, in that split second, it's like your mortal body dies for a second. Maybe it's between heartbeats, so you don't even notice it. And then it says you're quick and you're raised again to new life in Jesus Christ. I believe that your body, your mortal bodies are quickened by the blood of Jesus. Like you're dead for a second. I mean, it could just be for that heartbeat, between heartbeats. And then Boom. Something's new. Something's alive in me. Like I have real energy. That even works when it's dark outside. That even works when the wind ain't blowing. Why? Because it's the gospel. Power of God and salvation. For those who believe. The gospel means that I was dead. I died to my old self. I died to my addicted Joe. Addicted Joe is dead. There's a, a graveyard somewhere that says addicted Joe in it. There's a tombstone there that nobody visits. The gospel is that, that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Romans 6, 5 through 6, it says this, For if we have been united together in the likeness of his death. You see, the same way that Christ died, I died. Christ died a physical death. I'm not talking about a physical death here. I, I mean, maybe just for that split second, but I believe I died to my old ways, to my old uh, purposes. And I was raised again to new life. It says, For if we have been united together in the likeness of His death, certainly we also shall be in the likeness of His resurrection, knowing this, that our old man was crucified with Him, that the body of sin might be done away with, that we should no longer be slaves to sin. I, I don't need, I'm not a slave to the power grid because I got Christ, the power of God and the salvation living inside of me. I'm not a slave to money. I'm not a slave to education. I'm not a slave to, to influence. In fact, man, I'm not even a slave to manly approval. That's a tough one. I, I, that's a tough one. But it's the truth. The gospel is the good news. Jesus died for us, that we can have new life in Him. If you've been struggling in addiction, if you've been struggling in, in these things, you need to let that man die, be raised to new life, get plugged into the power source. The gospel, come on, how many of you realize the church in this season, we need to get plugged back into the gospel? The power of the church, the gospel of Jesus Christ. I mean, I don't even want to get into the baptism of the Holy Spirit to here this morning. Maybe, maybe that's next week. I'll talk about that power because we have another power. We have the power of the gospel and we have the power of the Holy Spirit. And both words there is dunamis in the Greek, which is where we get the derivative for the word dynamite. I mean, how many of you know if you like dynamite on something, that something ain't the same no more? 
Come on, the power of God and the salvation is the gospel. When the gospel gets a hold of you, you ain't the same no more. But when the Holy Ghost gets a hold of you, you still, you, it's like a rechange. Man, I, I, I lived so many years without having an understanding of the baptism of the Holy Spirit. And then one day I had to die to that person. And it was like, man, a new life came alive in me. The Spirit of God began to dwell in me. I was baptized new and fresh. And I, I mean, the, the thought that I could actually stand up here and talk to y'all, yeah. pre-baptism of the Holy Ghost, not going to happen. I remember one time I did a, a conference in front of a bunch of oil field engineers, and uh, it was like 10 guys, man, and I'm like sweating buckets because I'm so nervous. I mean, you know, it's not because I practiced. I don't practice. I mean, it's not. It's because I was baptized in the Holy Spirit. Just what it is. It's the power of God and the salvation. It says the power is available to those who believe. I'm going to invite the worship team to come up. It says the power is available to those who believe. The gospel To those who believe. Belief requires humility. You have to have a divine revelation that whatever your old power source was is no longer adequate. And you have to humble yourself. Say, Lord, I, I need you in my life. You can't work for it. You can't pay for it. You can't pray for it. You have to believe. It's already been done. It's already been done. You just have to believe. Believe takes a step of faith. You have to believe. Say, Lord, I surrender my life. I, I, I'll use this example. We have power outlets all throughout the side of this building. And I believe that there's power in those power outlets. I believe it. But just my belief in that power outlet, it does me no good unless I actually plug an appliance into there or something, charge my phone, whatever it is. I believe there's power. Sometimes we can't see the power, but that doesn't mean it's not there. If you don't believe me, then go stick a, a paper clip in that outlet. You'll quickly learn there's power there. Don't do that. It'll kill you. When we try to use the gospel for our own means, our own methods, our own purposes, don't do that. It'll kill you. We have to come to the Lord humbly and say, Lord, I need your power in my life. I surrender. I surrender my life to you. I surrender my money to you. I surrender my education. Paul even says this. He says, although I was a Hebrew of Hebrews, I, I, I was an apostle. I mean, I, I had the most education. I, I was trained and discipled by the most powerful men. I, I had it all. I, I mean, I graduated from the Jimmy Swaggart School of Ministry. But he says this. He's, he didn't really say that. That was me being a little facetious. He said, I, I was trained under Galamalel, right? The, the greatest Bible teacher of all times. He said, although I have all these things, I counted all loss for the sake of Christ. Here this morning, I don't come to you with my education. I certainly don't come with my money or my influence or my, my lofty words, but I come to you today as Paul came. He says, I'm not ashamed of what God's done in my life. I'm not ashamed of the gospel, that gospel that healed me, that gospel that set me free, that gospel that delivered me, that gospel that, that put me on a new path, that gospel that gave me hope, that gospel that gives me peace even in the midst of the worst storms. I'm not ashamed of that gospel because I know it's real. I know what it's done. The gospel has changed me. It's the power of the gospel. This morning, I want to give you an opportunity. If, if maybe, you've been, maybe you've been on an alternative energy thing and you say, you know what? I need to plug into the real source of truth the real source of peace today. So when the storms of life come, I know that I still have that power living within me. That power is the gospel of Jesus Christ. 
who died for us, even while we were yet sinners. He died for you. Even when you were in the midst of your sin and your pain and your suffering, Christ died for you. Even when you were stealing stuff at the store, He died for you. He was His. We, when we give our heart to Him, we say, "Look, Jesus, we die to ourselves." Paul said this: "It's not I who live, but Christ who lives." within me. He crucifies the flesh daily. Go read the book of Romans. Man, it is powerful. I'm not ashamed of what God's done in my life. And it's really the only thing I have to stand on. We overcome by the blood of the Lamb and by the word of our testimony. My testimony. What God's done. I'm not ashamed of that. Can we stand together this morning? as we just draw to a close. When I believe with all my heart that the end draws near. I mean, I can, we can go to Matthew 24, we can go to Peter, 2 Peter chapter 2, we can go to all over in Scripture, you begin to see the signs of the times that, that, that the gospel will be scoffed and mocked, that there'll be wars and rumors of wars, that the earth will be shaken on its very foundation, that our society will be change. Let me tell you, friends, the end draws near. This is a reality that we all need to deal with and reconcile today. Where are you drawing your power from? When our economic systems crash, do you put your faith in finances? When our educate, when, let me tell you, your, your diploma won't buy bread. None of those things are bad. I think those are wonderful things. But the truth is, we need to know the gospel. That's the power of God and salvation. We need to put the gospel back into church. The gospel needs to be the primary power source for First Assembly. So I want to do one of two things. I want us to pray. I want to make a commitment as a church here this morning. As the, as the leader of this church, as the pastor of this church, I want us to come into agreement in prayer today that says the gospel will be the power of this church. Well, not our worship team. I love our worship team. They're wonderful. Amen? Come on, y'all give our worship team a round of applause. They're wonderful. <laughs> not knocking them. They, they are skillful and, and, and practiced. I love, I love all our worship team. But they're not the power of God unto salvation. I love our prayer ministries. I love our altar ministries. I love our pastoral care network. I love, I love all those things. But for us, the power is in the gospel. We're going to be a gospel-centric church. So what I want to do is right now, if you're with a family member or someone that you know really well, would you just take their hand? And I know it's COVID, so you know use your discretion. We're just going to come together as a body and just hope, just family members take their hand, loved ones. And I just want us to repeat this prayer one in one unison together. Just saying, Lord, we're going to we're going to commit ourselves to to the true power, the gospel of Jesus Christ. Can we pray that prayer together? Would you repeat after me, Heavenly Father, today I commit myself to your work. I commit myself to the gospel of Jesus Christ. I believe that it is the power of God unto salvation. And as part of this body, I commit today that my church will be a gospel church. It will be a power church. It will be a faithful church. It will be a church on fire with your love and your peace. Thank you, Lord, for hearing me. Thank you, Lord for reminding me of the simplicity of the gospel. Thank you, Lord, for saving me and setting me free. It's in Jesus' name we pray.